Hey everyone, Mr. Harvey here. Let's get started on chapters 10 and 11, and we are talking about the French Revolution and the age of Napoleon. Now, the French Revolution and age of Napoleon, ladies and gentlemen, is wild. It is arguably uh, one of the most important events in modern European history. It's going to be a game changer and really going to set the tone in some of the major changes that we're going to be seeing in the 1800s uh, and uh, 1900s, ladies and gentlemen. And this is an event, ladies and gentlemen, specifically speaking about the French Revolution, where we are going to see the Enlightenment in action in Europe. Okay, we've already kind of talked about the American Revolution, the Enlightenment principles being put into action. Well, this is where we see a lot of the Enlightenment put into action in uh, Europe, and we are going to see the French lose control of this. It is going to be it is going to be quite a, a period of instability. And Charles Dickens. Uh, he, in, from his famous uh, novel, A Tale of Two Cities, kind of summarizes the French Revolution with this quote uh, from, the, from the novel where he says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epic of belief, it was the epic of incredulity. Uh, incredulity. Um, he, we are going to see, ladies and gentlemen, this French Revolution really represent a period of change, instability, chaos, terror, and eventually result in the rise of Napoleon. Okay, so let's get into it. All right, the French Revolution, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is, uh, uh, is from 1789 to 1815, and I'll kind of talk about the dates a little bit. Um, but this is just a monumental event, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to forever change uh, uh, France and um, France and Europe as a whole. Um, it's going to change Europe on a political, a geographic. We're going to see the map change, uh, an economic level, ecclesiastical level, a social level. I mean, the changes are. Uh, numerous, and uh, we are going to be seeing that. And so it's really important for us to understand the effects of this revolution, okay? And eventually this revolution is going to lead to the rise of Napoleon, which I'm going to get into. Um, uh, you know, many historians uh, consider the French Revolution to be the most important historical event in modern times, and I would, I will make a similar argument, and we will see some of the arguments to support that. Um, but there are just going to be some serious changes that come about because of the French Revolution, um, and there's some debates on uh, when the French Revolution starts, when the Fr French Revolution ends, and I'll and I'll be kind of discussing that as we get uh, into the French Revolution. Um, you know, the, uh, especially with the ending date, some historians believe that you know the French Revolution might end with the the the, the, the reign of terror. Um, I kind of define uh, the French Revolution uh, along with uh, other uh, historical thinkers uh, that the French Revolution kind of um, uh, ends with Napoleon falls from power, and that's in 1814, 1815. Um, and we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of look at some of that. But I, I believe, personally, um, that that's when kind of the, uh, the French Revolution ends, because we start to see a little bit of uh, stability return to France. Now, we're going to see France revolt a couple more times, but they, 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 we'll see, we'll see uh, some sense of stability return to France, especially after Napoleon and the Napoleonic Wars. Let me give you a little bit of context, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, into France in uh, the late 1700s, okay? In, any, in, in many ways, it's considered one of the most advanced countries um, of the 1700s. I believe that, I believe and would argue that the, the, the most advanced country during this time would definitely be the UK. Agricultural revolution is going on. Uh, um, the industrial revolution is going on in uh, the UK. Uh, they are definitely at the cutting edge of um, uh, advancement and ideas. Uh, and, but France is following along quite closely. France has a large population of 25 million people. It's one of the wealthiest countries in the world. It has a very uh, powerful and strong monarchy with under the, the reign of Louis XVI, uh, the Bourbon monarch, uh, and his wife, Marie Antoinette. Uh, and France is also a cultural center uh, of the continent. The Enlightenment was, uh, uh, France was a, uh, an epicenter of uh, the uh, the Enlightenment. France was is an epicenter of art, um, of, of culture, uh, France is also the French language is also the language of diplomacy. It's it's a, a, a very uh, common language spoken uh, around uh, many European governments, uh, and France also has uh, arguably the most powerful army in Europe. Now we know that they're not they're not the most powerful military force in uh, Europe, especially when it comes to the navy that would belong to the UK. But they have a very powerful army, and that's partly due to their large population. We're going to see Napoleon exploit that when he fights. We will see that. Okay, Napoleon's going to be putting, you know, half a million people on the battlefield, and, and you know, his adversaries are going to be like, uh, we're, we're going to see that, okay, uh, the, French, the, the, the might of the French military. Um, but this is kind of some context in where uh, France is at when uh, 1789 goes off. 
let me give you a little bit more, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to quickly just uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, Louis the Fifteenth. Uh, now we, I have, um, he's not super important for us to understand, ladies and gentlemen. Louis the Fourteenth, more important for us. Louis the Sixteenth, who's going, who's a monarch during the French Revolution, more important for us. But I just want to give you a little bit of context into Louis the uh, uh, the Fifteenth. Uh, who uh, is in between those two rulers. Now, during his reign, ladies and gentlemen, this is Louis XV, the nobility is going to start to gain some influence. This is important for us because this is kind of in opposition to what uh, occurred under Louis XIV, where the, the aristocracy and the nobles lost law power and really could not challenge um, the monarchy. And remember, we saw that with the Palace of Versailles. That was a great example of the power of the monarchy over the nobility. Um, Louis the Fifteenth uh, was very much influenced by his ministers and his numerous mistresses. Um, and during his reign, ladies and gentlemen, is we are going to start to see a little bit of a power struggle, and that is between the High Court of Paris, the Parisian Parliament, um, and the monarchy. Now, prior to Louis the Fifteenth, um, Louis the Fourteenth had really curbed these Parisian parliaments. And remember, don't get these Parisian parliaments confused with. Uh, the English Parliament. Those are two different institutions, but they do serve a similar purpose, and it's the idea of challenging the monarchy for power. And we are going to see during this time, ladies and gentlemen, that this Parisian Parliament is trying to replicate what's going, what Parliament, the uh, English Parliament, uh, does in the UK, which is check the power of the king. And that's kind of what this Parisian Parliament wants to do. It wants to be able to. Uh, and it, it's restored during this time with the power to approve or disprove the king's decrees and really trying to serve as a check on the power of the monarchy, right? Um, we're going to see Louis XV, uh, you know, uh, confront these this Parisian parliament and strip it of its power. However, Louis XVI, ladies and gentlemen, is going to restore this Parisian parliament to power. And what's important is you don't need to memorize all this, ladies and gentlemen. But what's important is we are starting to see the nobility, ladies and gentlemen, and the monarchy jockey a little bit for power, okay? And we're going to see this power struggle uh, eventually engulf the rest of the uh, the uh, uh, the French citizenry with with um, uh, with the French Revolution. And and, it, and I'll kind of get into that a little bit later, but we'll be thinking about that with the Estates General and taxation, okay? Uh, we're seeing the monarchy and the aristocracy kind of really fighting for power a little bit. Let me give you a little bit more context, ladies and gentlemen, and we need to talk about the three estates. Now, we've covered the three estates a, a little bit, and I just kind of want to review them and, and go over them in some detail. This is going to be super important for us, ladies and gentlemen, in the French revolutions. We have got to know our three estates. They are so important for us, okay? The three estates, ladies and gentlemen, are a remnant of medieval France, okay? They're a remnant of medieval France, and they represent the division of the French citizens, Um uh, socially, politically, economically, okay, this is this is a huge division of the French uh, citizens. And what's important, ladies and gentlemen, is we see some privileges for certain estates and we see some oppression for uh, um, uh, another state, mainly the third estate. So let's talk about that and let's know it. So the first estate is the clergy, okay? Uh, they own uh, around 20% of the land and they are less than 1% of the population. Okay, so they own uh, they own twenty percent of the land. They're less percent. Uh, they're less than one percent of the population. And ladies and gentlemen, this is key. They don't pay taxes. They don't pay taxes. That's going to be an issue, and we're going to we're going to we're going to uh, get into that. Okay, the nobility, the second estate. All right, two to four percent of the population, similar to the first estate. They don't pay taxes. They own 25% of the land, and as illustrated through those Parisian parliaments, they are experiencing a resurgence um, since uh, after Louis XIV is gone. And they're really trying, and illustrated with Louis XV, trying to you know jockey for power a little bit and take some power away. All right? Um, but they had a lot of privilege, okay? A lot of privilege that dated back to medieval times, and a, a definitely a really important privilege, ladies and gentlemen, they had is they did not pay taxes, Okay? And this is also interesting, ladies and gentlemen, is they could also tax their peasants for profit. So not only did they not have to pay taxes, but they could tax their peasants more and make a profit off that, make money off that, all right? Definitely an inequity that we are going to see really um, help facilitate and instigate our French Revolution. The third estate, ladies and gentlemen, very important for us, okay? 
This is everybody else. So this is people who do not belong to uh, the clergy, do not belong to the nobility. And so this is important for us to understand that you might have some very wealthy people within the third estate. All right? They just aren't part of the clergy and they don't have a title of nobility. You might see some members of the third estate even be wealthier than some nobles, but they don't have that privilege. And so they want that privilege. And that's going to be a, a point of friction between the third estate and the second estate that's eventually going to help facilitate um, the French Revolution. But you have merchants, middle class, and uh, the mass peasantry. The peasantry during this time, ladies and gentlemen, uh, own roughly 40% of the land. This contrasts with the serfs and we, and we, with Eastern Europe, where the serfs are tied to the land. They don't own any land. The nobles own the land. The peasants uh, during this time, ladies and gentlemen, they own some land, which is important. All right? um, but they, what's important for us is they bore the burden of the tax. A land tax, the tithe, the tithe, the church tax, income tax, poll tax, salt tax. They bear the tax burden. Okay. Also, peasants had feudal obligations. The corvée that forced labor. The uh, they were not allowed to hunt on the land. The nobles had that privilege. Remember, we talked about we talked about that though, that those hunting privileges, and the third estate resented this. They resented this inequity, especially when it came to taxation, okay? And the third estate, we're going to see the wealthy bourgeoisie, some of these rich merchants, artisans, they are going to demand um, and they're going to be jealous of that privilege that the nobility and clergy have. And they're going to demand social and political power to be congruent. And, uh, uh, and we're going to see, a, 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 the, especially the wealthy um, merchants, upper middle, uh, middle class within the third estate, they're going to demand change. They're going to be representatives of the third estate, and uh, eventually they're going to get the, the the peasantry to kind of on their side, the urban peasantry as well, and um, uh, it's it's going to go off. Okay, it's going it's going to go off. Okay, let's talk a little about the French monarchy, ladies and gentlemen. All right, um, and the two monarchs that we really need to know within the French Revolution are uh, Marie Antoinette and uh, Louis the Sixteenth. Okay, Marie Antoinette and Louis the Sixteenth. All right, let's talk about Louis first. All right, um, he's going to rule from 1774 to um, 1792, and similar to Charles I, ladies and gentlemen, he is going to die. He is going to be executed. Um, now, he was, um, and we're going to talk more about Louis um, uh, and kind of how he handles this whole situation. Uh, he was very much loved at first, but over time, you know, he's going to be considered very detached and ineffective and uh, very similar to Charles I, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to see this as we go throughout the revolution. He's going to lose control, and he's going to make some very silly mistakes and not understand how dire the situation was, not understand what is going on in France and not be able to really, um, you know, understand the changes. Okay. And remember that that's very different to some very successful monarchs we've seen like uh, Elizabeth, um, like Henry of Navarre, who understood the situation, who understood what was going on, the context, um, Louis, very similar to Charles I, is not going to understand that situation, and he's going to and he's going to end up dying for that. Okay, and he will uh, he will be executed. Let's talk about Marie Antoinette, ladies and gentlemen. Very controversial figure uh, it, within the French Revolution. She was Austrian. She married Louis when she was fourteen. Uh, became Queen of France uh, four years later, um, and uh, the French people did not like her. Okay, they did not like her. She had uh, um, uh, she spent enormous amounts of money on diamonds, on clothing. Uh, she gambled away lots of uh, uh, money and precious um, items, and she was disliked by the uh, the French people. All right, um, here's a picture of her with the uh, the royal children. Okay, all right, uh, and it's, there were numerous scandals associated with her. One such, uh, and this is uh, one that's uh, um, uh, very well noted, is uh, her necklace. Uh, uh, there was a necklace scandal associated with her, and and keep in mind that France is very much in debt during this time, uh, having financial problems, and she uh, 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 she got a necklace that was worth a hundred million dollars, and and it's the idea of image. The, the French people, you know, the, the the artisans and the peasantry, seeing the 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 life and luxury of their monarch, um, of the nobility of the clergy while they're suffering. This is just not. This is just does not look good. And um, uh, in terms of you know uh, equality for the monarchy and um, uh, this necklace scandal of spending all this money when you know the peasants are starving and being overtaxed and 
you know, things there that France is having financial problems. It, it, it's not, it's, it, it's not good. Um, uh, there's another uh, 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 kind of controversy associated with Marie Antoinette, this idea of her saying, let them eat cake. Uh, she never said that. Uh, but the idea is that I kind of just want you all to understand is that um, uh, the French uh, people did not like her. Okay, they, she, they did not like her. She was not well respected. And um, people did not like Louis um, the 16th uh, for marrying her. They, they did not approve of that marriage and they did not like her. And uh, she was called Madame Deficit uh, for all this, her, her, her spending. And, um, and the, the monarchy definitely had, uh, you know, uh, a spending problem. Okay, a spending problem. Let's talk about causes to the French Revolution. And a lot of the, and the major cause of the French Revolution we're going to see is finance, is money, okay? And the people, the, and we're going to get into that, all right? Uh, let's talk about long, long-term causes first, ladies and gentlemen. Really important. The American Revolution, okay? The American Revolution is going to be an intellectual cause to the French Revolution. Um, many French were intrigued by the American ideals of liberty and freedom. Many French soldiers had served in America, Okay, and they're going to be bringing back these ideas, a declaration of independence, uh, a, a constitution, a bill of rights. The French, uh, the American Revolution uh, is going to be very uh, influential intellectually to the French Revolution. And you're going to see many people looking across the Atlantic at the United States saying, wow, they have a government without a king. Can we do that too? Very important, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, the Enlightenment. Another intellectual cause, the idea of Locke, Montesquieu, Rousseau, Voltaire, uh, laissez-faire, Adam Smith, capitalism. These ideas are popular. These ideas are very well known. And these ideas are going to help fuel criticism against the uh, government inefficiency, government spending, corruption, uh, ideas of saying, hey, the monarchy spending all this money. Should they have that right to spend that money? Should Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI have the right to buy all this stuff? You know, should the first and second estate be exempt from taxation? These ideas are going to help fuel the criticism of the government, of society, and be very uh, influential to the revolution um, taking place, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, the three estates, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, is going to help facilitate the uh, is going to be a social cause and help facilitate the social conflict from the third estate. Is is the uh, inequity? Is the idea the third estate is going to resent the fact that the first and second estate don't pay any taxes. They're not going to like that. They own so much land and they're only representing a certain, uh, a very small uh, portion of the population. Okay, so the, the, the in, in inequity of the three estates is going to be super important, ladies and gentlemen, um, a super important cause for the French Revolution. And a political cause is just going to be Louis the Sixteenth. Um, Louis, he's going to be very ineffective. He's going to make some very um, silly mistakes, ladies and gentlemen, some really um, uh, just just serious mistakes. Um, and he really, and this is very similar, ladies and gentlemen, to, um, to Charles I, like I said before, is he did not understand what was going on. He did not understand the bigger forces at play, and he's really going to lose control of this situation. He's really, and he, he's going to make, you know, mistake after mistake and really... You know, it's going to end up costing him his life and the, and, 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 and the monarchy. Okay? Let's talk about the immediate cause, ladies and gentlemen. And I said this before. It's money. It's economics. Money. Financial mismanagement. Okay? This is, this is very important. Let's get out that highlighter. Let's circle this. Okay? Very important for us. The major immediate cause that is going to facilitate our French Revolution is money. And I've alluded to that before in the Seven Years' War with the... Um, uh, uh, France supporting the American Revolution, okay? Money, all right? In the 1780s, France was nearly bankrupt. They did not have money, okay? They have been spending a lot of money on Versailles, uh, the monarchy on Versailles, right? We know that half of their GDP goes to just maintaining Versailles, okay? And they've been spending all this money on the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution. France is broke. They don't have money, okay? And guess what? They don't, their first and second estates don't help pay any of that money, okay? And so France is in, France is in a bind of what to do, okay? So money, all right? Um, the interest in payments on the royal debt 
amounted to over 50% of the French budget. And the big problem that France has, ladies and gentlemen, was tapping into their wealth. Remember, I just said earlier in context that France was one of the wealthiest countries. And y'all are sitting there going, wait, what? They're super wealthy, yet, wait, they're having problems with debt and they're almost bankrupt? Well, the problem is, is they can't tap into that wealth. The first and second estate don't, don't pay anything and they have so much money. And so the French monarchy, the French government can't tap into that wealth. Okay, and they're going to try to, and that's where we're going to start to see some fighting. Okay, they're going to try to, all right? Um, the first, remember, so the first and second states were not required to pay, and that's going to be a big problem. Is France is, and that's going to be something that's going to eventually, you know, start the slide towards revolution. Is what's France going to do about this debt? Are you going to tax the third estate more? Uh, okay, are you going to make the first and second estate pay more taxes? Um, they're not going to want that. So, you know, Louis in Louis in a bind. He's in trouble. Okay, and the French government's in trouble. What are they going to do about this debt and this bank and and being bankrupt? Okay. Um, now we're also going to see, ladies and gentlemen, e ecological cause. There's going to be a really bad harvest of 1788, one year before the revolution breaks out. And if I didn't say this before in the lecture, but we need to know the dates of the revolution: 1789 to 1815. These are very important dates for us. But the year before the revolution, there's a bad harvest, and the peasants are going to be on the brink of starvation. And that is going to be very important, ladies and gentlemen, because the peasants are going to be overtaxed, starving, hungry. That, that's a problem. Okay, that is a bad, that is a, a, a bad combination, okay? And um, uh, eventually we are going to see um, uh, uh, the peasant, the, and the peasantry is going to pay, uh, play a really important role within the revolution, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Uh, the peasants were already taxed their limit. They're starving. This is not a good, this is not a good recipe for a healthy society, for a healthy country, all right? Um, let's continue talking about the financial mismanagement just for a little bit, and then I'll kind of stop when we get to the the, um, uh, the Estates General. But you know, due during the 1780s, ladies and gentlemen, France is going to be unable to solve its debt and financial problems due to the unwillingness of the first and second estates paying taxes. Um, you're going to have uh, Jacques Necker. He's going to be the uh, royal director of finances. He's going to fail to resolve the problem. And here's the problem: is that the first and second estates, it's 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 it part of their 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 society and the, the privilege um, is the first and second estate don't pay taxes and Necker is going to be like hey first and second estates can you pay taxes and they're simply going to be like uh, no all right and so Necker is having a hard time of where to get the money we're going to see um, a new uh, royal director of finance uh, uh, Charles Alexander de Colon uh, try to solve this problem he's going to he wanted to introduce new taxes he's going to summon this assembly of uh, notables an aristocratic noble institution and the assembly of notables is simply going to say no nope we're not paying taxes all right and so that's this is the big problem all right and we're seeing the nobles versus the monarchy for power all right we're in the nobles are sitting, simply sitting there saying all right we'll pay taxes but what's in it for us and of course louis doesn't want to decentralize his power and so this is this is kind of a fight over power and eventually this is going to result in the estates general and, uh, and the, the revolution starting. Uh, we're going to see Louis uh, replace Cologne with this uh, a new advisor, okay, de Brienne. Um, and he, he, he's going to have tax reforms, a land tax, but that's going to be rebuffed by the uh, Parisian, the, the, uh, the Parisian parliament, a noble institution. And the nobles are going to uh, declare that any tax changes have to be approved by the estates general. And he's also going to be refused by the clergy. And so Louis is tr sending out his, his financial ministers trying to tax the first and second state. And they're simply saying, uh-uh, nope, nope, we're not paying taxes. Uh-uh, what are you going to give us in return? And this is the big problem. Okay, this is the big problem. All right, Louis doesn't know, Louis does not know what to do. All right, Louis XIV probably would have asserted more control. He probably would have gone after the nobles, okay, with force. All right, um, Louis the Sixteenth, he's trying to be a little bit more cordial, a little bit more diplomatic, and um, th th this is he, he's having he's having tr trouble with the situation. Okay, all right. Uh, now, eventually, ladies and gentlemen, the bankers are going to refuse to extend credit to the government. All right, and 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 the bills are due, and Louis the Sixteenth uh, is going to be forced to summon the Estates General, and this is where uh, things are going to get ready to start. It's, it's summoned in July of 1788 and it's going to be meeting in May of 1789. So we are getting close to the revolution, ladies and gentlemen. And the Estates General is a feudal assembly that represented all three estates and it had only met twice in the history of France. 
13.02 and 16.14. So it's been a while since this estate general has met. And Louis is going to be forced to convene it in order to try to solve this problem of the debt. Okay, the debt. All right, and let's take a look. We're going to take a look at the money and some figures right now. But take a look at how much income, income, the peasantry spent on food or bread. Um, in 1787, they spent around 55, 50% of their income on bread. After the bad harvest, 1788, okay, they spent 80% of their money on bread. You think the peasants can, in the urban uh, poor and the, the rural peasant, peasantry can afford new taxes? No, they, they, th this is a problem, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it, it's the money, it's the finances. Um, take a look at the urban commoner's budget. 80% of their food, okay, 80% of their money went to food. 25% of their money went to rent. 45% uh, uh, went to two different taxes, okay? And then 20% went to clothing. Look, at it, it, they, they don't have the money. They don't have the money. That's a, that adds up to 170% uh, of, their, of their money. And they don't have all that money. So they're going to have to cut out 70% of this. What, food? What? They, they have to pay taxes. They have to pay you know, rent on their land. What are they going to do? And that, so here's the problem is the, the, uh, the urban commoner, the, the peasant, they, they don't have money. They don't have any money. And the, the inequity is so astounding. And Louis knows that he cannot raise taxes on the third estate even more because well, the, the commoner can't pay it. And so this is, this is a big problem for Louis, ladies and gentlemen, a huge problem. Okay. And here's the king's budget. 50% of their GDP is just paying off the interest to their loans. 25% going to the army. 25% going to Versailles. Okay? Coronation. Loans. Administration. All right? Sometimes this Versailles would be up to 50%. All right? Would go up to 50% of the budget. All right? They don't have the money. The financial problems, the financial mismanagement... It's astounding. It's not like you need to memorize all this. Just understand that France has mismanaged its money. It is struggling with money. Um, and they got to figure out how to, how to solve their finances. Okay, just another, uh, just another uh, uh, picture, ladies and gentlemen, illustrating the, the, the problems with the French um, budget. Okay, and you have, right, like you have, the, this, is a, this is just kind of a cartoon. Where is the tax money? Where is the money? And you can see kind of the, the nobility and the clergy just walking out the door with it, right? France needs to be able to pay off its debt, and they cannot pay off their debt because the first and second estate, ladies and gentlemen, uh, have all the privilege, and they cannot. France cannot tap into that wealth. They cannot uh, gain any of that money, okay? We'll stop here for today, ladies and gentlemen. We'll stop right here, and in the next lecture, we're going to start talking about the revolution starting, and it's starting with the Estates General of 1789. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good day.